I, um, <laughs> I actually just flew back from Australia uh, last Friday for an agricultural conference where I'm involved with the Royal Agricultural Societies of the Commonwealth, big long lengthy name, um, in which Northlands and like Calgary Stampede, organizations like that are involved in the RASC. And Princess Anne is our president. And so, you know, as I was introducing Princess Anne to the rest of our delegates um, just last week, and she goes, oh, you know, she, and she loves to have conversations about agriculture and about the sustainability of our land and where we're going in the future and, and all these fun things. So, I mean, I, granted, I'm just waiting for her to give me Prince Harry's number. Um, <laughs> You'll know when, you know when that happens. But, um, but yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. I do look forward to speaking to everyone this afternoon, or this evening. Um, now, I am the oldest of five girls from the family farm. And actually, as I was flying back from Australia, you know, the customs officer looks at me and he's like, you don't look like a farm girl. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm a farmer. <laughs> you know, granted with growing up on the family farm, that, you know, I, I meant every word when I said in the video that, you know, it was, it was important for everybody to pitch in because it provided, right, the food on our, on our backs, the roof over our heads, and the food, you know, that's on the table. And so having learned values and working side by side beside my sisters and parents, um, and also our hard man Richard, who has been with us for over 25 years, working together as a team in feeding the cattle, um, getting the crops in in the spring and harvesting in the falls and you know taking long hours and back when we were smaller we picked a lot of rocks and a lot of stumps <laughs> and a lot of everything and, and 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 it was hard hard work but it was what we did but you know learning the values or having a hard work ethic and and having learned the the values of respect and responsibility and being held accountable to the jobs that we then had on the farm um, became very true and, and near to our hearts and also in having pride in the work we did on the family farm. Now mom and dad both come from family farms themselves um, as you know St. Paul, St. Vincent area is just two hours northeast of the city here and mom's from a farming family of 14 children and dad's from a family of seven children so it gets kind of cold up north. Hey? <laughs> Um, and so with that, you know, mom and dad didn't take over their family, their respective family farms, but they started their own family farm. And, and then these, you know, started having kids and out comes the girls. And, and we definitely had a lot, of, a lot of fun in working hard at the farm. Now, after, you know, when I was in grade 12, I was like, man, you know, what do I want to do after I graduate? I really had no idea. And so I was sitting at the kitchen table with mom and you know we're looking at universities and colleges and everything and dad who's sitting in the in the living room hollers out he's like hey Ona why don't you go to Olds College and find a rich farm boy <laughs> there's a couple laughs in the room but rich and farm boy don't belong in the same sentence <laughs> rich and oil field man maybe <laughs> well, no, but nonetheless I was like you know what that sounds like a great idea um, I headed off to Olds College in search of a husband um, was unsuccessful but in the meantime gained a degree in agriculture business in which I was beyond thrilled with because not only did Olds College give me that education in something that I was so passionate about which was agriculture they gave me the opportunity to get to interact with industry so to participate I remember as a college student you know I got sponsored to go to these synergy type um, conferences and talk about the industries talk about the challenges as far as how are we encouraging that next generation to be involved in the future of agriculture because no doubt right the farming operations have got a lot bigger they're more complex but I mean we have the world at our feet the next generation is globally connected you know as I'm tweeting away and you know my Aussie friends are like yeah good job Leona and what do we think about you know the challenges of agriculture and agriculture is the single thing that every country in the world has in common. Have you ever thought about that, right? Everybody needs food to live. Food, fiber, and energy are the three things. So off I went to college um, and they got me involved in industry. So I then became involved in the Alberta Young Farmers. That then became the Canadian Young Farmers. And then I got involved with the Rural Agricultural Society of the Commonwealth, um, which then has traveled me around the world um, getting to interact with like-minded young farmers and, and I mean 
developing world farmers and the challenges that they have um, out in their rural areas. So I'm going to share with you two stories on, um, from two developing country delegates or country stories where the first is in Papua New Guinea. I went to Papua New Guinea in 2009. And there, um, you know, we went up into the mountains and, and we visited with this village and we then climbed to the top of this mountain and we helped them plant um, about five acres worth of sweet potato. Now planting sweet potato is not taking a little potato and planting that in the ground. It's actually taking a vine, a part of the vine from an existing sweet potato plant, putting that in the ground, you know, hilling that up and that'll then grow more sweet potatoes. And so we had done a bunch of that, but we noticed that they weren't really planting their sweet potatoes in a row. So we didn't, you know, we didn't take over the full plot and be like, oh, you need to do it our way. We said, here's four little rows about the size of the stage. Here's four rows of sweet potatoes. You know, if it, if it helps you with weeding, um, with the production of, or more efficient production of sweet potato, see where it goes, right? the following, um, following later that day, we then made sweet potato silage for their pigs. So we grabbed a sweet potato and a cheese grater, and by we, I mean the women. We grated the sweet potato, and we put all that sweet potato into a garbage plastic bag, packed that down, let that, let that be sealed for about two weeks. In two weeks' time, they had a nicely fresh fermented sweet potato silage for their pigs. Now, if their pigs are able to, you know, be healthier, have more piglets, then number one, do they not only have more sweet potato and, and meat, right? Because they, they don't get very much protein in their diet, diets. Um, then they'll be healthier and they'll, you know, have healthier families and so on. The next day, we went to a school. And here in front of me, you know, was a room of 200 school children, um, elementary school, and we, we talked to, they knew English, because um, they're, they're taught their education in English. And we, we just chat, had a chat with them about, you know, about what they were doing back at the farm or back at home um, in regards to growing food to feed for themselves. And, and towards the end, because they were like really smart little guys and it just blew me out of the mind. And, and I touched one little boy on the, on the head, like kind of patted him like, good job. And, and everybody's like, ooh, and it was a, all, you know, everybody got all giggly and whatnot. And so I asked him, I'm like, guys, I'm like, we traveled from all around the world just to come see you. And they were pretty excited. I was like, would you mind singing your national anthem for us? So here in front of us stood up 200 of these Papua New Guinean children, and they sang their national anthem with so much pride and so much joy that I started to, to cry. Because here in front of me were children with secondhand clothes, most of them had no footwear, were walking to and from school miles away from home just to get an education, and they were the happiest dirty little buggers on earth. <laughs> If I asked a group of 200 elementary school kids to do the same from Canada, would they be as happy? And so if these families, you know, are able to, to have more of an income, or to, to have an income, right? Because if, if they sustain themselves in growing food to feed themselves, then maybe they'll have excess, you know, pigs or sweet potatoes to sell, to have money to send their kids to school. Because that next generation, they're the ones that's going to change Africa. Africa, in, in, in my eyes, has very little poverty because they're starting to have access um, to water, health, education, and, and they're doing well. Now, my second story for you is in Malawi. I was just in Malawi this last June. Malawi's in Africa, just north of, of um, well, I guess, around Mozambique and Zambia, north of South, South Africa. And there, um, I met a few young young people in agriculture and, and they were very excited because the one man in particular, he was given um, a chicken cage with a couple chickens in it. And I'm like, awesome, right? There again, it, 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 it becomes the small shareholder farmer projects, right, to help grow these communities so that they can become food secure and then potentially have an income and grow a bit of a, you know, a local economy. And so I said, awesome, you know, how did that work out for you? And he's like, well, 
the dogs got into the cage and, and killed the chickens in, on the second day. I'm like, oh, sorry to hear that. So how did you fix the cage? And he looks at me and he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, didn't you fix the cage and got more chickens and tried again? He said, no. And then I kind of thought about that for a sec. I'm like, okay, so here in a country where they're trying to give opportunities and trying to, you know, they're, they're being given handouts and, and everything, but they don't know anything about innovation or entrepreneurship. They just, you know, like it's, it's not instilled in their blood, right? They're, they're not growing up that way. So boy, how can we help them? Goes back to the school, the children that are in the school, they're the change makers. If we, um, for, for some of them who have, you know, who are out of school that are doing like a little garden plot and whatnot, they're like, everybody can, can grow food. They just have to do it, right? Because it's, it's kind of that work life thing. Um, so I think there, you know, we're, we're quite fortunate in Canada to have access to innovation and to be encouraged to be our own entrepreneurs. Now as a young agricultural ambassador, I recognize the vital role of sustainable agricultural production of food, fiber, and energy. So when I did the study um, of the Nuffield Scholarship, and Nuffield, ugh, how many here know about the Nuffield Scholarship? Raise their hands. Well, maybe not even like three of you guys. Um, the Nuffield Scholarship is just an agricultural sector. Like you can be in the environment, forestry, fisheries, any kind of environment sector. Um, it's a $15,000 scholarship for international study on a topic of your choice. Um, so a few years ago, um, after, after my youngest sister, Janelle, had graduated from high school after the passing of our parents and, you know, things were doing good on the farm and we were keeping on, keeping on, and, and um, I applied for this Nuffield Scholarship, being, you know, kind of on the younger scale and had done a bit of international travel before, so I felt pretty confident in doing that. And so I studied succession planning. Um, with the focus of how are we encouraging there again that next generation and farm diversification and, and all sorts of fun stuff. So some of my key observations there were that, you know, city, slick, city slickers make good farmers too. So if I was to ask the crowd, what is a farmer or what considers you to be a farmer? I like a lot of us our farmers, right? Even, even if we're gardeners, or if we have a greenhouse, or if we produce food or fiber in any way, we're farmers. And at the end of the day, well, we kind of all need farmers. I don't know. Does anybody have any ideas for a sexier word, farmers? How do we sexify farming world? Anyways, we'll talk about that later. Um, city Slickers. Now, when we were in Singapore, you know, Singapore is a city. You drive 40 minutes across Edmonton, that's the country of Singapore all city. And so when we went there, I was extremely surprised. I mean, it's hum they're right on the, on the equator. It's humid as heck, but they have trees and luscious, you know, um, rooftop gardens and all sorts of fabulous, really cool urban agriculture. So I was like, awesome. And so Kenny Yang um, is, the, is the president of the Kranji Countryside Association. So they have an agricultural association out in Singapore and they had their first farmer's market, like last month. And it was a huge success because people wanted to connect to you know, nature, wanted to connect to, um, in a way, their grassroots and, and have this production that was grown locally and, and all sorts of really fun stuff. So I was like, that is awesome. Like, how cool is that? And, and people, you know, like us as farmers, were like, oh, well, people need to know where their food comes from. And I'm like, yes. But how are we engaging them in the, con in the conversation? How are we um, telling them the positive story of agriculture? And if we're excited and passionate about what we're involved in, people are going to want to be a part of, you know, the whoop whoop train. Why not? Now, a second point is that succession equals change, and change is good. And in most cases, change is necessary. Now, we find that you know, particularly challenging when there's, you know, the next generation 
um, people who have the new ideas and they might be a little erratic for you know some of the ones that have been a while for a while <laughs> or been a, been around for a while but we got to give them the chance right we got to at least listen to them and take them into consideration so it's very much of what you're doing here at the synergy conference is you know like let's interact let's, sh let's share our ideas and even if there's an idea way out there it might very well get us to where we want to go so fear as i said in the video fear of change keeps us from planning for the future and if we don't embrace it then we'll lose out on that opportunity my third point is communication is key and very much fundamental in relationships and businesses, organizations, right? Communication, communication, communication is the biggest thing because if, you know, if somebody's frustrated about something but doesn't tell anybody else about it, well, how are we going to solve the problem and, and move on? So, you know, there again, share, share your passion. Um, and with that too, and I say it briefly, this isn't my succession talk, but you know, for, I hope everybody here has a will. <laughs> and if they do have a will, then I hope you've at least talked about it with, um, with, the, the, with your family, right? With the beneficiaries. Have that open communication about your will because for a lot of parents, um, whether you go at the same time or at different times, you know, we, we're all gonna die at, at one stage. We don't want your will to become, or to be read as your last testament of love. Because your children, right, will presume that to be something else and oh, he or she is getting more than I am and you know, equal is always fair, but fair is rarely equal. In that estate planning will world. Attitude is everything. How many of you guys agree with me on that? Bah, okay. <laughs> If you're grumpy, whose fault is it? The person in the mirror. It's not your wife's fault. <laughs> right, it's the person in the mirror. Now attitude is everything and no matter what happens to us in life, we must take the time to appreciate all we have and all we can do. Everything we have as far as materialistic things and, and relationships and everybody in our lives have played some sort of an influential role in our lives. So we need to be appreciative for that. But everything we can do, how many times do we you know, bring to the forefront and, and, and really be thankful for, man, I dressed myself this morning. I fed myself this morning. We can walk, talk, breathe. <laughs> In my Nuffield, um, my Nuffield study, because Canada belongs to the Nuffield family around the world with Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and a few other countries, where there was an individual um, by the name of Rob Cook. He was in a helicopter accident a few years back and became quadriplegic. So he's paralyzed from the neck down. He applied for a global study tour in the, in the Nuffield scholarship family because he wanted to empower those who were physically unable to have an active role on the family farm, right? If, if you're passionate about something, nothing in the world should ever stop you from doing it. And man, is he a whole bundle um, of inspiration because we're pretty lucky, aren't we? Now enjoy the little things after those days, those long days of picking rocks and stumps and a lot of dirt in your eye. Um, you know, dad'd be like, hey, come on girls, let's go to town for an ice cream. And we'd do that, you know, and like, and that's all it took. We were happy to pick rocks all day because we got an ice cream at the end of the day. Um, and challenge yourselves to achieve your dreams. It was mom and dad's dream to raise their family on a farm. They did that. It was dad's dream to become a pilot. Ever since computers came out, he had every single flight simulator game <laughs> that was ever sold. And when it came to the point where, yeah, you know, the, the, farm, the farm was doing pretty good and, and he was able to take that time away to get his pilot's license, have a plane. We had a beautiful airstrip just in back of the house in the field and we'd go crop checking go check on the cattle out in the pasture and go check on them crops and man if, if you've never had the opportunity to go check crops like the weeds or like the misses at the back of the field <laughs> it's fascinating 
and, and, and it was something that he adored doing. Nothing should stop you. Now, in thinking back about, um, you know, the treasured memories that we had with mom and dad, um, you know, it kind of, it, it gets some, summed up in saying they lived life to its fullest. And they did that in, in, in having an open mind, in taking risks, in, in, in encouraging us girls to be a part of every single part of the farm and to, you know, to become whatever we wanted to be. I said, well, if one thing didn't work, you can always come back to the farm, get regrounded and choose another thing. You know, pick something that, that you love doing. And so a few points on living life to its fullest, in my mind, is having an open mind, but also learning how to forgive. Because families, family matters, organizational matters, <laughs> whatnot, right? We always run into those challenging times. So forgiveness is valuing the relationship that you have with that person more so than your own ego. Having a bucket list. How many of you guys have a bucket list? And about having a bucket list is things that you want to do before you kick the bucket. Yeah, quite a few. That's awesome. So one of the things, I have like a bunch of goofy things on my bucket list. If you guys need ideas, check out my website. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I have on there that I love doing continuously, it's kind of a multi multiple check thing, is that I go through the Tim Hortons drive through And I don't drink coffee, but I'll order my yogurt or my hot chocolate or whatnot. Go through the drive through get to the window, pay for my, um, my order but then I'll offer to pay for the order of the person behind me. Now one time, a girl in Red Deer, she got so excited, she's like, oh, you're paying, paying it forward. And, and I was like, yeah, so then for fun, I was like, well, what's the longest lineup of people that you have had that have paid for each other, right? Because you're, you're creating this opportunity, well, hey, if I got paid for, well, I might as well you know, pay it forward on and pay for the next person. So any, any guesses, anybody wanna shout out any guesses of what, how many people would have paid for each other? Oh, damn, you're good. <laughs> 21. Who said 21? <laughs> awesome. 21 people. <laughs> um, fascinating, right? A lot of times people are like three, four, five. Yeah, 21 people. And man, <laughs> did the 21th person just not have enough change or something? Hey, <laughs> not a big deal. But that was, you know, like, but that, why not? If ever, if ever you find yourself in a grumpy mood or just need a little pick-me-up, do something nice for somebody else. And I guarantee that it will change you up. Um, I have no idea if I still have time, but I'm gonna tell you guys another story. When I was in Sydney, Australia for their agricultural show a few years back, um, had kind of fulfilled all my, um, my duties and whatnot with the show and speaking and stewarding and that sort of thing. I, um, I grabbed a clipboard and an empty piece of paper or a blank sheet of paper and I grabbed a marker and I wrote free hugs on it. I went to go with the clipboard to stand in the busiest intersection at the Sydney Agriculture Show where millions of people go to and I flipped over the board. Okay, here's my free hugs, right? So holy man, do I ever feel vulnerable at this stage? But the reactions that I very soon started to get were priceless because you know, I had children run up to me and, yeah, come give me a hug. So I'd lean down and give these people hugs. Um, I had a group of teenage boys mob me. <laughs> I figured something was up because their girlfriends were kind of standing around with their cameras ready and I wasn't too sure, but that was kind of fun. Um, and I mean, granted, yes, there's, you know, those couples that are walking by and the guy's like, yeah, and the girl's like, no. <laughs> Right? But at the end of the day, it puts smiles on people's faces. And, and, and it was a blast. I would recommend anybody to try having that experience at any time. Now, hard work. Um, people from Alberta, from rural Alberta, if you're passionate and you work hard at what you do, give yourselves a pat on the back because we would not be where we are today or where we will be heading in the future if it is not for each and every one of your guys' involvement, especially in being involved in a conference like that. So for that, I commend you um, on your hard work. Now being genuine and kind and having faith and hope are important to being happy. 
And at the end of the day, my most favorite one is telling those around you that you love them. Now, of course, you know, we have our, our immediate friends and our immediate family that we love. Um, but in that sense, I also mean appreciation because at the end of the day, man, when we had flat, um, flat bottom bins and we had to go in there and shovel the rest of the, um, the rest of the grain out of the bottom of the bin, it's a dirty job. It's not, it's not a job that anybody really wants to do. But at the end of the day, dad's like, thanks Sona for cleaning the bottom of the bins. You did a really great job and I appreciate your hard work that you put in today. Because he said that to me, I was like, man, I'll go shovel bins again tomorrow. So a lot of that in organizations, in families, in everywhere, is if we show a little appreciation, we'll get that in return. They'll, you know, they'll feel appreciated and it's with all of us, right? If we feel appreciated, we'll put in the extra effort. So do what you love and love what you do. Be, be prepared to give more than you receive, right? Being selfless and being mindful. Remember that life is short, so why not make the most of it? Now I ask that everyone under or 40 or under the age of 40 to please stand up. <laughs> I'm pulling all the young ones out of the group. <laughs> okay, let me first and foremost say that this is a lot more than I expected. <laughs> Bonus, awesome. Now, as you spend the next couple of days together networking and sharing your own experiences, I challenge you to connect specifically with these younger delegates and ask them the questions of their aspirations for the future. For it is these young leaders who will continue as your legacy, opportunities created here at Synergy Alberta. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you this evening.